According to my dad, this bit of string is going to be a kite. Really? It doesn't look much like a kite to me. Dad's just run out to his shed to go and look for an even longer piece of string. He's been gone for a while now. I thought about turning the TV back on, but I did this instead. Look, it's a string doodle, a snail, in case you were wondering. Here's another one. How about I add some drawing? Yo, brilliant, if I do say so myself. Who knew string could be so useful? Apart from Granny Mavis, of course. String! The next time I'm in lesson get in a lesson that gets a bit dull, which happens, I'm going to bring out my emergency piece of string and make a few doodles. That way it'll look like I'm really busy, me being busy. When Dad comes back from the shed, he's smiling and holding up another piece of string. Here we go, Tom. This is perfect. I'm looking at the string, thinking it's exactly the same as the other bit. That's great, Dad, I say, trying to sound enthusiastic and failing. Normally, I love making things like my string doodles, but Dad came and interrupted me when I was right in the middle of watching the best cartoon show ever, The Crazy Fruit Bunch. He stood in front of the TV and started shaking his head in a disapproving kind of way. Tom, why are you stuck inside watching TV when it's such a lovely day? He wanted to know. Firstly, it was not a lovely day. It was damp and cold. Secondly, I was watching TV because the crazy fruit fruit bunch was on, and it's hilarious. But I didn't say that. I just kept my eyes fixed on the TV screen and shrugged. There are so many things you could be doing instead of staring at a screen. Come on, Tom, turn off the TV. Oh, Dad, that's not fair. Can I just finish watching my cartoon? I asked him. Honestly, Tom, when I was your age, I was always outside running about in the fresh air. I hardly ever watched TV, he told me proudly. That's because TV hadn't been invented when you were my age, Dad. It's quite old, after all. Of course, TV had been invented. I just like playing outside, climbing trees and making things with twigs, that kind of thing. What sort of things did you make with twigs, I wanted to know. I made a lot of things. Like what? You know, twig things. Things made out of twigs. Anyway, it doesn't matter what I made. The main thing was, I was out in the fresh air having fun. Playing with twigs doesn't sound like much fun to me, I told Dad. There are plenty of other things you can do outside. You can play in the garden for a start. It's too cold. So run around, or you could ask Derek over. I shook my head because I knew Derek was busy. He's at a friend's house, probably watching TV, I said, trying to make a point. I knew he wasn't, but that didn't matter. Derek at a hairdresser's. How about inviting your new neighbour June over? I'm sure she'd come round to play if you asked her. Well, that wasn't going to happen. Dad, it's not like I'm four years old. My friends don't come round to play anymore. Well, not unless we're having band practice. I definitely wasn't going to be asking June over since she moved to next door. She's not exactly been that friendly to me. What are you looking at? Exactly. It's bad enough having her cat wandering around our garden. And she's in my class too. Every time she sees me, which is a lot because she sits next to Amy Porter, who sits next to me, June thinks it's funny to say, Tom, you do realise that you three are actually a rubbish band, huh? I didn't know that. Which is not true and also really annoying. If I had an annoying meter, June would be about here, annoying. And Marcus Meldry would be here, really annoying. And June's cat would be unbelievably annoying. Annoying meter. Sometimes there's not much to choose between them. When Mum came in to see what Dad and I were chatting about, she joined in. You're not watching TV again, are you, Tom? She asked me. I'm trying to watch TV, I told her, while leaning to the side of Dad. It's not like I watch telly all the time. I just love the crazy fruit bunch. The chances of me being able to watch the rest of the cartoon were disappearing fast. It was impossible to concentrate with both Mum and Dad glaring at me, so I gave up and turned it off myself. Sulking face. Okay, what shall I do now? I asked them. Well, there's loads of other things we could do. Like what? How about we go for a walk? Dad suggests. A walk? Where to? I wanted to know. Somewhere nice, he said. The sweet shop's nice, I suggested. No, Tom. I meant somewhere like the park. If we had a dog, I'd be really happy to go out for walks all the time, I told Dad. We can't get a dog because Delia's allergic to dogs, Dad reminded me. So I said quietly, I'd rather have a dog than Delia. Dad didn't hear that, didn't hear me because he was busy picking up a bit of string that was on the shelf. I know, how about I show you how to make a kite, then we can fly it together and get some fresh air at the same time. Before I could say 
maybe or could we do that later mum got excited and said that's a brilliant idea it was an okay idea i'd still rather watch the rest of the crazy fruit bunch come on it'll be fun dad said trying to convince me and that's when he disappeared into his shed to go and find another piece of string mum went to the kitchen and came back with some plastic bags a couple of bin liners and a roll of sticky tape these might be useful Mum's got a thing about plastic bags and bin liners. She used them for everything. Emergency boots, emergency rain cape, emergency watering can, bird scarer. When Dad saw the plastic bags, he said they were perfect. Perfect for what, I wondered. All we need now are a couple of sticks and some scissors, Dad told me. Then he got some paper, drew out how we were going to make the kite. OK, I kind of get it now. Let's go to my shed and finish making the kite there, Dad said. So we did. We were supposed to be making this kite together, but every time I tried to help out, Dad would say, I'll show you how to do that, Tom, and take over completely. Look, we made it, Dad said. He's made it, but I didn't say that. Shall we go and fly it? Dad suggested. What now? Yes, now. Get your coat on, Tom, and let's go, like I had a choice. When we came back into the house, Delia was in the kitchen. Lately, she'd been going out a lot with her friends, so I haven't seen much of her. It's been great. She was looking at her phone, as usual. Dad said, look what we've made, Delia. Well, Dad made it, but I didn't tell her that. Amazing, Delia said, not even looking up. I bet you could, I bet you couldn't make a kite, I said. You're right, it's a life skill that passed me by. Mum says, well done, Tom. See what you can do when you don't watch TV. You must be so proud, Delia adds. But I'm not sure she really means it. Dad and I get our coats and set off to the park. He's holding the, the kite really carefully so it doesn't get tangled. The best, the best place to catch the wind is up on the hill, Dad says. There's a real knack to launching a kite, Tom. Yes, Dad. When we get to the hill, Dad checks the string is nice and tight. Then he shows me exactly where to run and how to launch the kite up in the air. It all seems easy enough, so we give it a go. I'm running and running, and Dad's frantically throwing the kite in the air, trying to get it to lift up. He's shouting at me. Nearly there, nearly there. Go on, Tom, go on. But the... But the kite keeps sinking down like a stone. Then it happens again and again. We swap over and Dad tries to run with the kite while I throw it up. Then I recognise someone who's walking towards me with a very tiny little dog. It's only Marcus Meldrew. If there's one person I wouldn't want to bump into right now, it would be Marcus. I bet he's going to make comments about my kite groan. I can't really ignore him, so I'm forced to say hello. Hi, Marcus. Hi, Tom. What's that? Here we go. It's a kite. What? That thing made from plastic bags is a kite. Yes, Marcus, it's a kite. My dad made it and I sort of helped. It flies really well. In fact, it's amazing. That kite can actually fly in the air, Marcus says, sounding surprised. Dad comes up to the Dad comes up to pick up the kite and says, Hello, Marcus, then walks back up the hill to have another go. I don't really want Marcus to stay and watch, especially as I've just told him how good it is. Ready when you are, Tom? Dad shouts. Oh, great. Bye, Marcus, I say to him, hoping he'll go. I'm not going anywhere. I want to see this amazing kite fly. Marcus says, annoyingly. OK, you will, I tell him, while thinking. Please fly. Please fly. Marcus takes out a half-eaten sandwich from his pocket and starts to eat it like he's at a cinema or watching a show. Ready, Dad? I shout. I shout. I throw up the kite. And I'll throw up the kite and you pull it and run at the same time. That's the plan. So far... This plan hasn't really worked. I let go and for a split second, a tiny bit of wind catches the guy and it's up higher and higher. Yes, it's flying and it's flying. Dad pulls the string to keep it in the sky. It works. It's flying. Hooray. Marcus has his mouth open like he can't believe what he's seeing. He's not the only one. I told you it flies, I say when Marcus's little dog runs past me and leaps into the air. And I say no, thinking he's about to jump at the kite. But it's the sandwich he wants. And he gets it too. For a tiny dog, he can jump a very long way. Marcus forgets about the kite and runs after his dog. He's really strong and nippy. The dog, not Marcus. Luckily, Marcus is out of sight when the wind drops and the kite sinks to the ground and lands with a crash. Dad and I go and look at the broken kite. We can fix it, he tells me. At least it flew, I say. Then we do a high five. When we get home, Dad goes straight to the shed to try and mend the kite. And I'm finally allowed to watch the rest of my cartoon, which is excellent. But I admit, kite flying was a lot more fun than I expected. I mustn't forget to take some string to school with me as well. 
Lucky String Doodle. Lucky Meter. A tiny bit lucky. Having my emergency strings in these lessons is proving to be quite lucky. It's keeping me occupied when Mr. Fullerman's voice starts sounding a bit like a robot. Blah, 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 blah. My, my mind starts wandering. If Mr. Fullerman spots me, I'll whisk the string out my desk and pretend to be carefully working things out. Trouble is, Marcus keeps staring over in my direction, which isn't helping. He's going to get me into trouble if he doesn't stop being nosy. I j it's just a piece of string, Marcus, I tell him. Stop staring. Too late. Thank you, Tom. I'll have that. Back to doodling, then. My lack of string means I'm da now down here on the lucky meter. Not lucky. Back at home, this invitation arrived when I was in the front room doing my homework. Well, I was thinking about doing my homework. Welcome tea party. Hello, we are your new neighbours. Rika, Sarah, our daughter June, and Rod Rick, Sarah, our daughter June, and Roger the cat. We're having a tea party. You're all invited to come. We'd love to meet as many new friendly faces as possible from 4pm until 6.30. I heard something being shoved through the letterbox, so I went to see what it was. I took the envelope and ran back in front so I could sneak a look out the window and see who posted it. I got a shock when I saw June staring back at me, so I hid on the floor until she left. I looked at the envelope and thought it might be a letter complaining about me playing do three too loudly again. It was addressed to everyone at 24 Castle Road. Everyone equals me. So I opened it. Luckily, it wasn't by new, few, just a tea party invitation. I put on it on the fridge like mum does to make things official. When mum saw it, she said, that's nice, we can all get to know them a bit more, which really meant she could have a little snoop around the house, but I didn't say that. Just checking. I called Derek just to check that he'd been invited too. I didn't want to be on my own at June's. He had. Phew. That could have been awkward. Dude 3 is still rubbish. I'm about here right now, I think, on the lucky meter. A tiny bit lucky. On the day of the tea party, Mum suddenly decides to make some biscuits. They smell delicious when they were cooking, but tasted absolutely disgusting. I must have mixed up the salt with the sugar, Mum says which is the sort of thing Granny Mavis does. But the good news was, Mum wanted me to go to the shop to buy something nice quickly, as if I'd picked something horrible to eat. A large pack of caramel wafers would be nice, but the shopkeeper said they'd sold out. What? I was shocked, until luckily I spotted some delicious-looking iced donuts in different colours. They looked very tasty, so I bought six donuts and some fruit cheese with me. The change for me. When I got... But Mum said, oh dear, I hope they taste better than they look. I thought they looked yummy. They'll have to do, she added. Dad came down wearing one of his slightly odd t-shirts. Is that what you're wearing, Mum asked him. It's tea with the neighbours, not the Queen, Dad said, looking down at his t-shirt. Just don't eat too many cakes then, Mum said. Mum said, Dad and I wondered who she was talking about. Both of you. Well, mostly you, Frank. We are the first people to arrive at the neighbours, which is awkward. June's mum is wearing a long dress and her dad has a headband on. Maybe my dad's t-shirt isn't so bad after all. They say hello to us and June's mum points to me and says, You and June know each other already. We're in the same class, I say. And June says, for now, like she knows something I don't. Can I go and look for Roger? He's gone missing, she adds, ignoring me. June's mum nods and asks if I'd like to go with her. Not really, but I don't say that. Instead, I say, no thanks, I'm fine. But June's already gone. It's our cat, Roger. He keeps wandering off, her dad explains. He's probably in our house or digging up the plants in our garden, I tell them. Which is true. My mum gives me a nudge and June's parents look a bit embarrassed. Mum changes the subject quickly and says, We bought something to add to the tea. That's very kind of you, June's mum smiles. You haven't seen them yet. Dad says it's a joke. Mum doesn't laugh. Do put it on the table next to my homemade cakes and bread, June's mum says. I use all natural ingredients and no food colouring. So much nicer, don't you think, she adds. Mum's looking at the donuts I've just put on the table. Yes, I suppose, if you have the time. The donuts do stand out a lot. When Derek arrives, we go and tuck in into the tea before anyone else does. But we can't decide what to have first, so we take a bite out of a few things. To see what's nice. This one's got bits in it, Derek says, putting it back. After a few more bites, we choose a donut each. After a few more bites, we choose a donut each. 
While we're eating, I can hear Mum taking, talking to June's parents about how much I spend watching the TV. Not as much as I'd like to. I stop chewing so I can hear what they're saying better. June's mum says, June doesn't watch TV because we don't have one. Then for some reason, my mum says, if we get rid of our TV, I wouldn't miss it at all. Why is she saying that? With a mouth full of donut, I say really loudly, I'd miss the TV. Don't get rid of the TV. Mum ignores me and carries on chatting like I haven't interrupted. Then she looks over and says, Tom really loves TV, but I only watch it occasionally. I'm thinking of all the TV programmes that I know Mum loves to watch. So in case she's forgotten, I keep reminding her of what she would miss if we didn't have a TV, especially when she's talking to June's parents. I'm just saying, no TV would mean no antique stage show or come dance with me. OK, Tom, we get the hint. Derek says he has to go home to take Rooster for a walk. He's so lucky. I wish we had a dog. Now Derek's left, I'd like to go home as well. Mum's still chatting, so I try and think of ways I can get Mum and Dad to go home. Aliens have landed. I feel sick. Deal is having a party. I settle on telling Mum that I have loads of very important homework to do, so I better go if that's okay. Okay, Tom. Dad says he'll come with me. I think he wants to leave as well. On the way out, I notice there's one donut left. Seems a shame to leave it. Not like he ate loads of other cakes and biscuits. Dad's just saying bye, when June's mum suddenly rushes past me, saying, Shoo, shoo, get, get off the table, Roger. Looks like June's cat's back then. Maybe I won't have that donut after all. Lick, lick. Homework meter. Must do it. I have to do my homework now. I've got no choice. So I'm up in my room trying to get started, but I keep getting good ideas for a comic I'm making about some of the characters from the Crazy Fruit Bunch. Then I find the letter I must have shoved in my exercise book to keep safe. It's all about enrichment week and what's going on in school. Next week we get to do different things in class than normal, which should be fun. <coughs> the Crazy Fruit Bunch. Let's fly, really. It won't fly. Fly, fly. It's not flying. Why? What? Banana gets an idea. Ready to roll. Uh-oh. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to work. It works a bit. Pineapple's gone green. Wobbly tight. It was really funny when Norman Watson saw the letter. He asked, does enrichment mean we're all going to get rich? No such luck, Norman. Mr. Fullerman told him, imagine if that really happened. How good would that be? Part of my homework is filling my reading diary. The book I have is excellent. It's a Dr. Planet book. But I keep forgetting to get Mum or Dad to sign my diary. So I've been signing it myself with a squiggle. Now even if I remember, I can't get them to sign it. As they'll know what I've been up to. I'm going to have to wait until the whole diary is filled up before I can get a new one. Right back to my homework in a minute. Here are the two more Crazy Fruit Bunch characters I made up. Crazy Kiwi Fruit and Mouldy Marcus Berry. Ha! Ah. As I'm drawing, I look into June's garden and I and can see her wander around searching for her cat again. She'll never find him there because he's hiding in our garden. I could tap my window and point out where he is. Or I could keep quiet. Shh! Roger! Spot Roger the cat. He's on the shed. Trouble meter. Very late. Big trouble. Instead of coming to the tea party with us today, Dealey went to meet her friends and came home really late. She forgot to take her house keys with her, so she had to ring the doorbell, which woke me up. Mum and Dad are downstairs waiting for her, and are not very happy. I get out of bed to have a listen. I open my door so I can hear what they are saying, stuff like, What time do you call this? And, You said you'd be home earlier. Why didn't you call? I put my head around the door to get a better listen, but I can't quite hear what Dee is saying back to them. Then a door slams and someone stomps up to the stairs. I quickly jump back into bed as Delia goes past my room, then slams her bedroom door as well. If I wasn't awake before, I definitely would be now. Mum and Dad will probably have one of their little, little chats with her in the morning. We're just disappointed. My guess is she'll be grounded for maybe a week. The only trouble with Delia being grounded is she mooches around the house the whole time, being even grumpier than usual, if that's possible, which it is. Are you eating that? Get lost. Mum and Dad are turning the lights off downstairs and coming to bed now. They're talking very quietly because they don't want Delia. 
or me, to hear what they're saying, which makes me listen even harder. I sneak out of the bed again, but it's tricky to see in the dark and accidentally trip over my school shoes, the ones I've thrown to the floor, along with a few other things. Whoops. I manage to stop myself falling forward by grabbing the side of the chair. But the chair slips and lands over with a loud thump. It knocks over a cup of hot chocolate with a nasty thick milk skin on it that I left because it looked disgusting. Uh Uh-oh. Mum and Dad come running into my room. What's going on? They both say, looking around at the mess. So I say, the loud voices and doors slamming woke me up and I couldn't see where I was going. Then I pick up my teddy and give him a little cuddle in case Mum and Dad get a bit cross about the stain on the floor. Whoops. I do my confused face too. Dad gets a cloth to wipe up the chocolate. Phew, looks like I'm not in trouble. I'm a bit tired now, I tell them both, and Mum says she'll tuck me into bed, which is nice. Then I say, I'm a bit thirsty as well, so Mum gets me a drink of water. I take a few sips and put it to one side. Mum and Dad are smiling at me, so I probably shouldn't say. I'm feeling a little bit hungry. A camera away for my help? Nice try, Tom. Good night. Oh well, if you don't ask. In the morning, there's no sign of Delia. Yet, as she's still in her room being all grumpy, I sit quietly at the kitchen table with my exercise book open, so it looks like I'm doing my homework, but I'm doodling instead. When I turn the page, there's another another letter that Mr. Fullerman gave us about enrichment week. This one's supposed to remind us we're making pizzas and to bring in the ingredients for our toppings. We don't usually do any cooking in our school, but with enrichment week, we get to try out new things. It was up to me. I'd add a few extra things to the list to try, like caramel wafer juggling and doodling with and without string. That would be good. We're not making real pizzas. We're just doing the toppings, so so nothing tricky, I hope. Mr. Fullerman gave us a piece of paper in class with a blank circle on it. We have to write down the ingredients and draw what our pizza would look like. Some kids, Brad Galloway and Mark Lump, thought it was more fun to make up a really crazy pizza toppings and draw them, which was a mistake. Mr. Fullerman picked up Brad's picture and read it out to everyone. Chocolate, marshmallows and fish fingers. That's very interesting, he said, and then sniffed in a slightly across the way. Enrichment week. Name, Tom Gates. What's going to be on your pizza? Write your name at the top of the ingredients here and draw a picture of what your pizza will look like. Tin tomatoes, cheese. Brad was giggling and smiling when Mr. Fullerman added, Are you sure that's what you want on your pizza, Brad? I like to mix my flavour, sir, which made us all laugh. Ha ha ha. I whispered to Amy. My granny Mavis makes pizzas like that. It's true, she does. Then Mr. Fullerman spotted Mark Clump's pizza list and read that aloud to everyone. Raspberry jam, chips and cheese, which made Julia Morton say, Ooh. Remember, Class 5, Beth, whatever you put on your pizza, that's what you'll be eating for lunch. I hope you like raspberry jam and chips, Brad and Mark. They both put their hands up and asked for a new piece of paper. My pizza was nice and easy, just two toppings, but I might bring up a backup snack in case something goes wrong. You never know. I carry on doodling and making up my own characters. Like this, when finally Delia appears, she looks extra gloomy too. Oh, great. Mum and Dad hear she's up and come into the kitchen. They're trying to be all cheery and light in the mood after telling her off last night, which is a waste of time if you ask me. (coughs) Mum says, We know you're cross with us, Delia. You can say that again. The next time we agree a time for you to come home, just stick to it, will you? I'm supposed to meet up with my friends to study again. It's your fault if I get bad marks, Julia tells him. That's a good one. I'll have to remember that. They can come here to study. We're just not allowed out for them for a week. A week? Like I said, if you need to study, invite them here. Really? Dad doesn't look so sure. What's wrong with my friends? Delia wants to know. I could tell her a few things. We all look like her for a start. Grumpy, stooped, a bit miserable. Mum says that her friends can come over as long as they don't play loud music, eat everything in the fridge, leave cups everywhere and genuinely make a mess. Then they're very welcome, Delia. Not by my standards, they're not. It's a terrible idea. It's bad enough having Delia sloping around the house without her friend here as well. I find hoping my good behaviour and me leaving my exercise book open to look like I'm working is being noticed by Mum and Dad so I can ask if Derek can come round too. Of course he can, Mum says. 
don't go in my room, dear Ligwin, but she always says that. It's not like I go in her room all the time. She only usually wants to borrow something like a rock weekly magazine or a pen or maybe some music and very occasionally a pair of black socks. As, as if she's been really annoying, I might borrow a pair of sunglasses and hide them. So, not that often. Don't bug any of my friends either. I don't want you or Derek asking them stupid questions like, What bands do you like? Celia puts on a really silly voice, which I think is supposed to be me. I didn't speak like that, I tell her. The thought hadn't even crossed my mind to bug Delia or her friends, but now she's mentioned it, it might be fun. Mum says, Just be nice to each other, will you? I carry on drawing and nod. Is that your homework, Mum asks? I should say yes, but it might be tricky to explain what subject it's for. It's very important doodle homework. So I tell her I'm just drawing and making up my own characters. They're really good, Tom, Mum says. Oh, that reminds me, and she gets out a puppies and kittens calendar. Nice lady at my work thought you might like it because I told her you loved dogs and drawings. I wish we could get a real dog, I sigh. Well, bad luck, you can't. I'm allergic to dogs and cats. Delia reminds me. Then she looks at the calendar and says, Why would anyone want something like that on their wall? So I tell her, Not everyone's allergic to cats and dogs, you know. I like it, and because I'm nice, because I'm a nice son, I say, Thanks, Mum, and start looking at the pictures. That's so sweet, Mum says when I show her the dog. Dad is smiling at the cute puppies as well. Oh, look, that one's got a hat like mine. Delia's not impressed. I can't listen to her. I can't listen to this. It's pathetic, she mutters before leaving, while we carry on looking at the whole calendar. Later that afternoon, Derek comes over at exactly the same time as Delia's friends arrive. Normally, she'd take them straight upstairs to her room to work. But today, for some reason, she decided to bring all of them into the company front room, which is very annoying because me and Derek have just sat down to watch TV. Move, will you, please? The please bit is unusual, so I say, sorry, we were here first. Tom, we all need to sit down here. Can you move? I ignore her and Derek does the same. Now, she's being all bossy and big sisterish with me in front of her friends. I ignore her and Derek the same. So you could go to your room and try writing some songs for that Battle of the Bands audition coming up, Derek whispers to me. I whisper back, yes, we could do that, or we could stay here and watch TV. I'm annoyed with it, which is an extra bonus. As we're not buzzing, Delia's friends start chatting between themselves, which makes for a good listen. I know some of the band's entering band battle this year. It's a really good prize if you win. Did you hear that? I nudge Derek and say, What other bands are entering then? I ask Delia's friends, even though she told me not to talk to them. Dad pops his head round the door and asks, Everyone okay here? I'm about to say no, when Delia gets in first. These two won't move. Can you tell them to go? But we were here before them. Come on, Tom. Delia and her friends have work to do. Can't you hang out somewhere else until they're finished? Work. I'll believe that when I see it. Delia and her friends waft a book, a few bits of paper and a pen around. But they're still not that convincing. But when Dad says, how about you go and get some fresh air? I say, OK, Dad, we'll go. I tell Derek, let's think about what song to play at the Battle of the Bands audition. Great idea, Tom, Dad says, and he leaves us to it. Delia's friends are still chatting about the audition, so we take our time leaving, which annoys Delia a bit more. I heard that murder do a wear jumpers are auditioning too. No, really? Then I make a joke and say they could put on fluffy jumpers and call themselves Nerd 3. Derek and Delia's friends start laughing. Delia doesn't. If you're in a band, why would you even think of wearing a fluffy jumpers on stage? Her friend wonders. Then Delia decides to try and embarrass me in front of everyone by telling them, my little brother has a fluffy yellow kitten onesie, don't you, Tom? You could wear that in your band. Very funny, Delia. I tell her, Dog Zombies are auditioning for, ba- for band battle and I'm not wearing a fluffy yellow kitten onesie because I don't have one, so there. Then Derek whispers to me in my ear, OK, I did have a fluffy yellow kitten onesie, but I don't have it anymore. Thanks for bringing that up, Delia. Delia starts shoo- shooing me away with her hands. Shoo, shoo. You stay here, she asks. I'm trying to think of something to say but back to her, but my mind's gone. Blank, 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 blank. Why are you still here? Delia says again. Uh, because I live here and he's my mate. Which is true and a good reply, I think. I'm sorry about these two. They're leaving now, Delia tells her friends. 
I've just got something else to say in a really loud voice. I tell them, did you know Dealey is a massive fan of the band Seven? Ignore him, it's not true, and you're not funny, John. I'm quite funny, because your friends are laughing, and so is Derek. I managed to get out of the way before Delia lobs a cushion at us. Derek's still laughing and says, Your sister is cross about that, wasn't she? Does she really like Seven? No, not really, but I've just had another brilliant idea. While Delia is doing her college year, Derek and I find lots of pictures of Seven and decorate her bedroom with it. Luckily for Derek, he's gone home by the time Delia brings her friends up to her room. From the way she's shouting my name, Tom! I'm guessing she's not that keen on the new posters. I keep my door closed until she calms down, which takes a while. Mum and Dad make me take the pictures down and apologise to her. It was still worth it, though. I keep out of Delia's way and do a few more drawings from their puppies and kittens calendar Mum gave me. In my ex and in my exercise book, I find the official letter about enrichment week, which I would have put on the fridge. I drew a few cats and dogs on it instead. It's not like I'll forget what I'm doing or anything. Enrichment week, school inspection. Dear parents, carers, this week we will ha be having a school inspection and enrichment week. This is a chance for the children to try out new activities. School lessons will continue in some subjects as normal. Your form teachers will have shown your child a list of activities, including any extra items they might need to bring into school. It's going to be a fantastic experience for them all. Please send children be on time and have a correct uniform on too. Thank you, Mr. Keen, Headmaster. The letter looks like more fun now. Enrichment. Should be a good week. Enrichment week, Nita? Okay. Soon as Ozzy left for school and is walking ahead of me and Derek, we're too busy laughing about how we decorated Delia's room to catch up. Ha ha! We nearly, we're nearly at school when Derek says, I think we're making a short film this week. What, with the whole class, I wonder? Yes, even Mrs. Worthington is going to be in it, Derek tells me. And I say, no close-up, John, which makes Derek laugh. I tell Derek, we're making pizzas. As soon as I say the word pizzas, I suddenly remember I've left my pizza toppings at home. You have enough time to go back and get them if you hurry, Derek says. I run back home. Luckily, I don't live far away. I open the front door and charge into the kitchen, saying, Mum, cheese, tomatoes, Mum, please, cheese. Mum's already gone to work and it looks like Dad's out too. Or he's in the shed and can't hear me. So I look in the fridge first. Cheese, cheese, what cheese? There's cheese everywhere. Which one do I choose? Just in case I take all of them and shove everything in my bag. Then I go to the cupboard to find a tin of tomatoes and two things happen. When I open the door, I discover the last thing is hidden behind some beans. Good. As I grab it, I knock over a bag of flour, which falls in slow motion. Slow motion. Past my hands. Narrowing, narrowly missing a cup on the side, then lands on the floor and all the flour spills out everywhere, and I mean everywhere. It's a mess. I try scraping the flour back in the bag with my hands, which sort of works, until I drop it again. The flour puffs up and goes in my face. There's not enough time to clear up or I'll be late for school, so I shove the bag the bag back in the cupboard and accidentally tread in a pile of flour at the same time. I forgot my shoes have hole in them. Pushing the flour into the corner of the kitchen makes it look a tiny bit better, but all done. Now I've run my bag and head to the door, leaving flour footprints as I go. As I'm walking to the school, the flour starts puffing out of the holes in my shoes, and it begins to rain too, which makes me a bit soggy because I've forgotten my coat. Great. When I finally get to school, something's different. The school entrance looks all clean and tidy, which is unusual. Mr. Sprocket is at the door and he looks very smart, not like me. Just in time, Tom. What happened to you? He asks. I had an accident with a bag of flour, sir. You'd better go and clean up a bit, Mr. Sprocket tells me. Yes, sir. When I see myself in the mirror, I don't look that bad. I brush away some of the flour and head off to class so I'm not late. Mr. Fullerman looks very smart, too. He's even wearing a bow tie. Hurry up and sit down, Tom. You're nearly late. Sorry, sir, I say, flower puffed out of my shoes. Amy Porter looks at me. What happened to you? Long story, I say. Too embarrassing to explain what really happened, and I don't want June asking me questions, too. Then I notice she's not there. Her desk's gone as well. Where's June, I ask Amy. She's moved to Mr. Sprocket's class, because it's smaller and she has more friends there. No more listening to her saying, Do you see a rubbish for me, then? I say cheerfully.
and this is the following announcements. This week is a very special week as we'll be doing lots of different activities. Excellent. And there will be uniform checks too. Mr. Fullerman is staring at me. Now, has everyone remembered to bring their pizza topping and ingredients? Yes, sir. I can say that now. The ingredients are in my bag. I take it. I take my bag off, put it on the back of my chair. There's a weird smell wafting around, but I can't tell where it's coming from. We have assembly this morning, so Mr. Fullerman says we'll be making the pizzas when we come back. I can't wait. As my chair is a bit damp from the rain, I push the chair near the radiator to help it dry out a bit while I'm gone. Good thinking. In class 5F, through to the hall, Mr. Keane is wearing a suit and tie. In fact, all the teachers are looking unusually smart. Solid, he's sitting behind me, says. The school's being inspected this week. That's why there's all that that's why everyone looks all fancy. That makes sense. Mr. Keane says, Morning, Oakfield School. Morning, Mr. Keane, we reply. You might notice that this week we have school inspectors here, so I'll be expecting correct school uniforms, no lateness and excellent behaviour. Not much then. On my way back to class, Norman tries to get my attention by jumping. Tom, up and down. Tom! But one looks from Mr. Fullerman and he stops pretty quickly. Solid tells me teachers get a lot more strict when there's an inspection. You've got a whole week of this too. Great. Mr. Fullerman makes us all line up outside the classroom. Listen carefully, Class 5F. I want hard work and concentration. No chatting, messing around or doodling. OK? Yes, sir, we all say. But when Mr. Fullerman opens the classroom door, there's a terrible smell. All the kids go wild and start making noises like, Ooh! Ah! Oh! What's that smell, sir? I'm not sure. We might have to open a window. Marcus is clutching his stomach and pretending to be sick. It's disgusting. It's not great. And as I get closer to my chair, I realise that the smell is coming from around my desk. Even with the window open, the smell is still really bad. I sit down and open my bag, and that's when the smell gets even worse. Marcus is pointing at me and saying, It's Tom Gates, sir. What? I'm not me, sir. It's my bag, I think. Mr. Fullerman is telling everyone to sit down and be quiet, please, at exactly the same time as the school inspector appears with his clipboard. From the look in his face, I think he's just got a whiff of the smell too. Mr. Fullerman peers into my bag and winces. I think your cheese is a bit ripe, Tom. Ripe? Like a piece of fruit, I wonder. Mr. Fullerman tips all my cheese out onto the desk, which makes Marcus lurch away and say, Ew! He's so annoying. Did you want all this cheese on your pizza, Tom? Not really, sir, I tell him, while holding my nose. How much cheese did you bring? I panicked, sir. I was in a hurry. Mr. Fullerman says, don't worry, I'll deal with the cheese and takes it away. Marcus keeps coughing and overreacting. Very funny, Marcus. The smell's gone now, I say. Well, nearly. Amy says I can have a piece of her cheese for my, for my pizza as mine is all gone now, which is nice of her. Thanks, Amy. By the time Mr. Fullerman comes back, the pong is not as bad. As everyone starts to settle down a bit more, Apart from Marcus, who keeps holding his nose and saying, Ooh, cheese, at me. You're hilarious, Marcus, I tell him. Right, class 5F, Mr. Fullerman says, Let's make those pizzas, shall we? We've all been given plain ready-cut pizza bases and a piece of special glittery paper to put them on. As we haven't any ovens in the classroom, all the pizzas are being cooked in the school kitchen for our lunch. Has everyone washed their hands and put on an apron, Mr. Fullerman checks. We all say, yes, sir, <coughs> apart from Norman, who's already eaten half of his cheese and can't speak with his mouth full. All I have to do is carefully open my tin of tomatoes with a tin opener and tip them onto a bowl. Then I spread some tomato onto the pizza base, which is easy enough. Well, for some people, Mark is making a mess. Then I grate some cheese on top of the tomato and it's all done. Brilliant. My pizza is a masterpiece. Doesn't look anything like the pizzas Granny Mavis makes. Jelly pizza, anyone? When the school inspector was in our class, I noticed he did a lot of writing. Now he's gone. I'm looking at the pizzas everywhere and feeling a bit peckish. It's a good job I have a backup snack. I take out my pencil case, which has a secret compartment stuffed full of chocolate raisins, and open it up. Open it up. I pick off the old pencil shavings that are stuck to them. As I'm quietly tipping the raisins onto the table, Amy asks me a question and makes me jump. Have you finished already, Tom? Yes, mine's done, I say, showing her my handiwork. But when I turn back round, 
to finish eating the rest of my raisins. They're all gone. Where are my raisins? I'm looking around and I suddenly spot them on top of Marcus's pizza. What are you doing, Marcus? I ask him. What does it look like I'm doing? I'm putting olives on my pizza, he tells me crossly. Marcus, you know they're not olives, don't you? I tell him. All, all I know is that my pizza is going to be the best, he says smugly. But Marcus, they're my... Oh well, too late, Tom, he says. They're my pizza now. It looks like... It's not like I didn't try to tell him. Mr. Fullerman gets everyone's attention by saying, So, you know whose pizza belongs to who? Write your names on the greaseproof paper. And well done, class 5F. They all look delicious. Some pizzas look more delicious than others. I write my name really clearly so, um, because I know whose pizza I don't want to eat. My raisin-free pizza. When the bell goes for break, I find Derek so I can tell him about my cheese smell disaster. What song we should play for audition at Battle of the Bands? No, Band Battle audition. We have to decide soon. Marcus walks past and says, Ew, cheese at me again, which is annoying. We try and ignore Marcus when Norman comes over and starts sniffing the air. He's right, there is a nice smell of cooking and wafting from the school kitchens. We follow the smell and peer through the windows looking for our pizzas. Nope, I can't see anything, but the smell is making me hungry. Then it says, I wish I, I was making a pizza. My pizza is going to be delicious, Marcus announces. Maybe, I say while thinking. Maybe not. I tell Derek we can have some of my pizza. Then I have an idea for the film his class is making. How about the school inspectors are really aliens in disguise and they don't want to take it and they want to take over the school first. Then the world. Good idea, Derek says. So so I carry on. If you're late for class, they zap you when you're least expecting it. I do some zapping noises. Zap. I think that school inspector in our class could be an alien. Now I do an alien impression which makes everyone laugh. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm an alien inspector. I'm an alien inspector. So I do it again. I'm an alien inspector. I am. Um, I don't get to finish what I'm saying because the school inspector finishes it off for me. Late for class. Off you go quickly. Oops. Unlucky. Great. Now I'm looking over my shoulder all the time in case a school inspector is lurking behind me. Groan. I'm walking back to class quickly when I see that Amy and Florence have noticed the nice... Look, cooking smells too. I hope that's our pizzas, I say to them. And ask, why aren't you in the music room practicing? What for? Aren't you auditioning for a band battle? Yes, but we've got loads of time to practice, I tell them. Flon says, there's a great group of kids from year six who's already got an audition and they're practicing like crazy. Really? Mr. Sprocket said it was okay. Did he? I've heard they're really good. So are dog zombies. We'll be fine. We have an idea for the audition, I say confidently. It's sort of true. Then as we go into class, Marcus walks past me and say, Ew, cheese, again. If he does that one more time, I'm going to tell him those raisins on his pizzas are really small bugs. I might do it anyway. Annoying meter. A bit, no, Marcus is uh, not very, but so annoying right now. After a break, I go back to class and Mr. Fullerman is tapping his watch. Hurry up, we can't have the school inspectors thinking you're late for class. All the time, can we? The good news is there are loads of interesting drawing things around. Excellent. This is my kind of lesson. We had to decorate and decorate and design our own placement mats for our pizza lunches. We can make a group table decoration too. There's a special prize for the best and most creative one, Mr. Fullerman tells us. I love a prize. Here's my decorated mat, which I'm really happy with. My pizza goes here. Now I've finished drawing on my placement mat, I have a good think about what kind of decoration I can make from this lump of clay. I have a few ideas. Marcus is drawing a picture of his own face on his placement. He tells me, I don't want anyone else eating my pizza. This will stop them. No one's going to eat your pizza, Marcus, especially with those chocolate raisins on it. But I don't say that. Yet. Instead, I start making a monster out of the clay. That looks good, Tom Amy says. Shall I make a stand for it, which is a good idea, because it's a bit wobbly. Marcus sees what we're doing and reminds us it's supposed to be a group table decoration. What shall I do? Then I suggest Marcus draws another picture of himself with legs, not just head this time, and make it this big so I can cut it out. Can you do that? Duh, of course I can. I'm not an idiot, you know. I say nothing. Marcus does a drawing and gives it to me. What are you going to do with it? 
he wants to know. I'm still making the monster by telling. You'll see. It'll be good. It's be- it better be if you want to win the prize. There. All done. What monster? Big monster behind Marcus. Now Marcus is complaining about being eaten by a monster. Why does it have to be me? It looks really good though, doesn't it, Marcus? I'm going to do a new drawing of you, Tom. He tells me. Then Mr. Fullerman comes over and congratulates us on making a fantastic table decoration. Whose idea was it to put a drawing with the monster? Before I can say anything, Marcus says, It was mine, sir, and my drawing, too. Typical. Even Amy is rolling her eyes. I thought you wanted to change it, Marcus, I reminded him. Not now. Annoying me, sir. Marcus is up here. Off the scale. While Marcus is still being all smug, I pop a bit of chalk into my pocket for our next break time. Chalk is useful for drawing on the ground, which might come in handy. As we finish doing everything, a lot earlier than Mr. Fullerman expected, he reminds us about our reading diaries. I hope you are keeping your reading diaries up to date, Class 5F, I say. Yes, sir, even though I haven't. Then Mr. Fullerman says he'll read us a story for a change. Would you like that, he asks. There's a big chorus of, yes, sir with Norman jumping up and down out of his seat. We all quieten down and listen. Mr. Fullerman holds up the book he wants to read, which looks interesting. He's good at doing all the different voices too. The Very Special Recipe by Zil Nishop. Warning. This story contains bugs, cockroaches, rats, mice, bad hair. Bad people with bad hair. Bad hair that's really a squirrel, but not necessary in that order. And a lot of other odd things as well. So if you're feeling a little bit queasy or have a slightly weak stomach, may I suggest that you put this book down right now and go find something else to read instead, or take up knitting, or do both, because some of this story might have you reaching for a bucket, and not, and I'm not even going to hint at how the story ends, as just thinking about it makes me feel ill. Still here? Well, don't say I didn't warn you about the gross stuff. Look, there's one of those disgusting bugs now. I told you they were horrid. Chapter 1. In the dead of night, one tiny little cockroach scuttled along the pipe and headed towards the delicious smell of food that was wafting towards him. If cockroaches could talk, this one would have been calling out over his shoulder. Hey, come on, everyone, follow me this way. But as far as I know, cockroaches can't talk, so you'll just have to use your imagination here. Hundreds more cockroaches poured through the pipe behind him. The closer they got to the light and the smell from the tea shop, the more their legs picked up speed. The bugs spilled through the open an open grate and hit the ground like a cockroach. Starburst. Scattering in every direction, ready to explore their new home. Across the shelves, up the walls and over the tables they ran. This was about to become the biggest cockroach tea party ever. Woohoo, what a great place. We, we, we've struck lucky here, the cockroaches were saying, or wouldn't be saying, if they could talk. The tea shop was packed full of freshly baked cakes, biscuits, bread rolls, ice buns and chocolate eclairs. There were stacks of macaroons, brownies and flapjacks, all powered high with glass display counters. The sliding doors were firmly closed, for now. The thick layer of bugs scratched and desperately searched for a way to get inside, but when the rats and mice arrived they knew exactly what to do next. A push here, a slide there and the glass door were open. The bugs quickly smothered the tasty treats and began to jump and bite their way through everything. The whole tea shop was teeming with creatures, excitedly chewing and crunching. They didn't stop eating until the sun came up, and there wasn't a single treat left that hadn't been nibbled, tasted, squashed, trodden on, or much worse. And if cockroaches could talk, they would be saying, I'm so full I couldn't eat another crumb. Or, great tea party, wasn't it? But like I said, they can't, so just keep using your imagination. When Apple and and Plum Crumble decided to go downstairs early for a change, the last thing that either of them expected to see was when they opened the door was this. The tea shop was in a terrible state. It was a disaster. They called out for their mum and dad to come quickly. Look what happened, they shouted. The food inspectors and the mayor were due to arrive that afternoon. What are we going to do now, Apple said, looking around at the chewed cakes. Mum and dad will know what to do. Don't panic. They always think of something, Plum told her confidently. Exactly what, what, 
that something was. You'll have to keep reading to find out. Slam. Mr. Fullerman slams the book closed and says, Right, who's ready for some lunch? I wanted to read more of the story. Oh, the class will say. We can read some more later. It's time for your tasty pizzas. You must be all hungry. I know I am. Rumble, rumble. Julia Morton puts her hand up and says, Mr. Fullerman, I'm not that hungry after the story. Those bugs haven't put anyone else off their lunch, and there's a mad rush to be the first in the dinner queue. Mrs. Mumble is trying to make sure that we all walk slowly. Best behaviour, she tells us, mouthing the words. Inspector, so we don't forget they're here. I was hoping to be much nearer the front of the queue, but somehow, despite some very fast walking, me, Solid and Norman are almost at the back, which is annoying. When I'm so hungry, even more annoying is Marcus has managed to wheedle his way to the front. How did he get there, Solid wonders? I'm pretty sure I know. Follow me, I say. We nip along the different staircase, which brings us to another door, and almost to the front of the queue. I wait for Mrs. Mumble to get distracted, then we all sneak in. Mrs. Mumble is busy showing one of the inspectors where to sit down. As we walk past, I whisper to Solid, he caught me doing an alien impression of him. We all try to do our best to look like we've been at the front of the queue the whole time and haven't taken a shortcut at all. By the time Marcus realises where we're standing, it's too late for him to complain. Huh? Mrs. Mumble says we can go in now. Result. I head straight to the table with our decoration on it. My pizza is on my placement mat, along with everyone else's. It's a piece to feast. And even better, my pizza tastes delicious. Everything going really well, right up until Marcus goes and makes that stupid noise at me again. Ew! Cheese! Okay, that does it. I take a really good look at his pizza and then say, Marcus, you know those aren't olives on your pizza, don't you? And he says, yes they are, I put them on. Then Pansy, who's sitting next to Marcus, leans over and says, they don't look like olives to me. I don't know what they are. I do. What do they taste like then? I ask Marcus. He pops a big piece into his mouth and says, they taste yummy. Mm. He's pretending to like the burnt chocolate raisins on his pizza. Who would have thought flies on a pizza would taste that yummy? That good, Marcus, I say. Very funny, Tom. I'm not falling for that trick, he says. Pansy stares at them a bit more. You're eating flies. He doesn't believe me, but you can see their legs, I tell her. Marcus is beginning to wonder if it might be. He started poking at one of the, the raisins, then picks it up with his fingers for a close inspection. Ew, flies, I say, just to make the point. Marcus starts wafting the raisins under Pansy's nose. Say it's not a fly, which makes Pansy lurch away from the suspected fly. Then Julia Morton hears the word fly and turns around really fast, so water spills all over the table from the jug she's holding, and the kid next to her accidentally drops his pizza on the floor. Mrs. Mumble hears someone shout, Ah! and comes running over to see what's going on. No shouting, please, she says sternly, just before she slips on a slice of pizza and shouts, Ah! really loudly. She stops herself from falling over by grabbing hold of the table. But she makes the whole table wobble, so a plate of jelly and custard balanced on the edge tips over and runs right on the lap of guess who, yes, that school inspector, who doesn't look very pleased. I'm not the only kid laughing. But for some reason, he looks right at me, like it's my fault. I stop straight away. Something else to write about in me and my school report again. Groan. Luckily, caretaker caretaker Stan comes to rescue and arrives just in time with his super-sized mop and cloth to clean up the mess. I'm not sure how well the school inspection is going, but my guess is we'll be about here on the inspection meter right now. Inspection meter. Terrible. I'm going to have to stay out of the inspector's way as much as I can, otherwise the, remor- the report might end up looking a bit like this. Inspection report on Oakfield School. Th- this school might have passed its inspection if it weren't for one boy in particular called Tom Gates, who managed to lower the score for everything because of his very shabby behaviour. What a shame. Lateness for school? Fail. Causing accidents? Fail. Pushing into the dinner queue? Fail. Drawing funny pictures of inspectors? Fail. I concentrate on finishing my delicious pizza while watching Marcus try to pick off the burnt chocolate raisins from his. When I leave the dinner hall, he's still doing it. So I say, ooh, flies. As I walk past, I can tell he's still not sure what they are. The rest of lunch break, I hang out with Derek and Solid. Then Derek tells us how the filming is going in his class. Not bad, we're pretending the teachers got taken over by aliens who land on Earth disguised as plants. 
but it sounds amazing. Mrs. Worthington makes a very good alien, that's for sure. I can't wait to see that. I am an alien. I tell Derek and Solid how I keep seeing that same school inspector all the time. Which one? Derek asks. The one who was in the dinner hall. The lead, the lead inspector, Derek asks. No, this one. I got out my emergency piece of chalk and do a drawing of him on the ground. You know who I mean, the one with the slightly weird hair. Then I remember my piece of string, which is handy. Weird hair? String. You must know who it is now, I say. Solid does, but Derek's still a bit confused. He's the inspector who looks over his clipboard all the time. The one who's got jelly on his lap and has lumpy hair like that. I say, pointing to the string when a voice behind me says, I never thought my hair was lumpy. Not again. It's the same inspector. Bad luck, Tom. Derek whispers to me. Another thing to add to the school report, then. I pick up my string and tell a little kid who's looking at me. This this might look like a piece of string, but it could be a kite. They're not that impressed. On the way home from school, Derek is laughing a lot about my chart drawing. It looked like him, he says. Then he suggests, you should come over to mine. I've got a new song for the band, which sounds exciting. And you can see Dad's, Dad's cat barriers. Cat barriers? That sounds interesting, too. June's cat keeps sneaking into the garage and sleeping. This is on Dad's record collection. It's driving him crazy. Derek's dad likes to come and listen to us rehearse when we have band practice. He gives us tips on how to perform and play too, which Derek, which Derek loves, not grown. I'm here! I rush into my house first just to let Dad know I'm home and to look for treats. Mm, nothing. Then, when I get to Derek's house, I see what he means about the cat barriers. They're everywhere. Are they working? I ask Derek as I step over them. Not really. Then before he plays me my new song, I ask him, What's it about? And he says, Cats. No, really, what's the song about? Cats? Well, one cat. Oh, okay, he's not joking. It's a song It's a song about a cat. Derek's recorded a tune to sing, so I listen. Mr. Fingal suddenly appears and starts clapping his hands and jumping up and down. We both think he just likes Derek's song, really. <coughs> Turns out June's cat has sneaked past the barriers and he's just showing him away. 
While Mr. Fingal chases the cat over the garden fence, I tell Derek, I love the song and I'll try to learn it if he sends me a copy. When he comes back, Mr. Fingal tells us, that cat's got some nerve. You'd think he'd know by why, why he's not welcome. Cats can't read signs, Dad, Derek says. It's a good point. Well, he won't be back here again, Mr. Fingal tells us confidently. Not until night time, anyway. In the morning, thanks to June's cat keeping me awake all night, I'm really tired, and I still have Derek's song going round in my head. Ah, my cat. Ah, my cat. And, and round in my head. And I can't stop singing it either. Ah, my cat. Ah, my cat. Don't mess with me. Hey, Tom, you sing like a cat, too. Delia's awake, then. Groan. Sorry, Tom. I take that back, she adds suspiciously. A cat sounds a lot better than you. Morning, Delia. Are you still grounded then? I mind her because she's being annoying. No, not anymore. You'll be pleased to hear. I am. She won't be in the house bugging me, which is good. I go downstairs and Mum's already gone to work early. I'm hoping she's left a nice packed lunch. That way I can avoid eating in the dinner hall. Today, all the school inspectors have gone. I spot a note on the fridge that looks promising. Tom, lunch in the fridge. Yeah, lunch. Fingers crossed Mum's put a treat inside for me. I take a look and there's nothing. So I check around the whole kitchen... As as the usual place mum hides the treats, just in case. Teapot? No. Behind the tins? No. The last place I look is in the real biscuit tin, and I've only gone and found a caramel wafer. This is a good start to my day. Derek's waiting for me outside already. Hi, Tom. Guess what I say? What? I have a caramel wafer in my lunchbox today. Just saying the words caramel wafer makes me want to eat it. As we walk to school, I, I take out the wafer and look at it. Let's have it now, I say to Derek. Isn't it for your lunch, he asks me. Yes, but I can't wait. Then I carefully unwrap the wafer and split it in half. I give one bit to Derek and the other bit's for me. Mm, mm, mm. Then, to make the wafer last a bit longer, I split up the layers and eat the chocolate off the layers as well. This works with cr- custard creams too, I tell Derek. He says, Do you think we might be a bit late? It's, re- it's really quite everywhere. We're not late, I tell Derek confidently. We've got loads of time. Yum, yum. You're late, Tom. Mr. Fullerman tells me as I run into class. Sorry, sir, I say and sit down. Amy looks at me and pulls her face. What have you been eating, Tom? It's all around your mouth. Must be the caramel wafer. Marcus starts looking at me, too. He says, Ew! I try and ignore him. If I were at home, I'd pick up the crumbs and eat them. But with Amy, Marcus and Mr. Fullerman looking at me, I wipe them out and just scatter the crumbs around the table a bit. I find myself moving the crumbs into a pattern and write them and write my name in it, Tom. That's disgusting, Tom, Amy says. Ooh, it's not like I'm going to eat them or anything. It's not the best start to the day, but it does get a tiny bit better. One, I get two questions right in our maths quiz, which is good for me. Marcus gets one right and one wrong. I managed to avoid all contact with any of the school inspectors for the whole day. It was a mission. Three, at lunchtime, I discover a cereal bar the mum gave me in my... Lunchbox. It's not that much of a treat, but it's better than nothing. Derek's class have finished making their alien film about the teachers, which got me thinking and doodling. Right at the end of the English lesson was Mr. Fullerman. What if Mr. Fullerman is really an alien and so is Marcus? It's a funny end to my day. If I had my own lucky meter, it would be here right now, because I've had quite a few lucky escapes, which doesn't happen all the time, that's for sure. The first lucky escape happens when I woke up at 7 o'clock this morning. For a change, I went downstairs for breakfast, then I spotted Mum's to-do list stuck on the fridge that was written at the top. Urgent. Must take Tom to buy sensible shoes. Really? If I had my own to-do list, sensible shoes with Mum would definitely not be on it. But finding the list early meant I could make a few changes, like rubbing out sensible shoes for, for a start. Urgent. Must take Tom to buy sensible school shoes. Also buy toothpaste, foil, shampoo, A4 paper, envelopes, fake tan for extra glow, washing powder, healthy snacks for Tom's lunchbox, cereal bars, apples, and adding a few extra nice things to the bottom of the list. It now, though I had a feeling Mum might notice some of the changes I made. It looked a bit messy, urgent. Must take Tom to buy sweets. Also, buy toothpaste, foil, shampoo, A4 paper, envelopes, fake tan for extra glow, washing powder, healthy snacks for Tom's lunchbox, cereal bars, apples, caramel wafers, treats of any kind. (coughs) So I decided the best thing I could do now was to scrunch up the list and throw it in the bin instead. Fingers crossed Mum won't notice it's missing. 
But the first thing Mum says when she comes down the stairs is, Where's my list gone? Huh? What list, I say? Which is a combination of pretending not to know about the list and having a mouthful of cereal. I'm not sure I left it on the fridge, she adds, looking around. Then Mum only goes and says, Never mind, I think I can remember what was on it. Oh no, I wasn't expecting that. I try and change the subject like Dad always does and ask Mum if Derek and Norman can come over for Dog Zombies band meeting today. Mum doesn't say no, which is a good sign. So I quickly go and call them to see if they're free. When Derek answers, he says he wants to come round now because his mum wants to, him to tidy his room. She might forget about it if I come to yours, he says. I'm not sure. Norman's still asleep, so I call him back later. I go back to the kitchen and mum's already writing a new list. I can't see anything like shoe shopping on it, which is a relief. Everything's going fine until Derek arrives and accidentally tri- trips over my old school shoes that I kicked off last night. The shoes jog Mum's memory. Now I remember. Look at your shoes. We must get you a new pair today, Tom, she says, groan. And what's all the white stuff inside? It looks like flour. Do you spill that flour, Tom? I keep quiet and shrug my shoulders. Derek mouths sorry to me, but it's not his fault. I remind Mum that I can't go to shoe shopping as I've got friends with me. We'll go later, then Mum suggests. Norman's coming over too. I can't really go, I say, again, in case you didn't hear me. Mum's idea of sensible shoes is bound to be different to mine. Those are nice, nerd. I tell Mum that we have very important band practice and it's going to last for ages, won't it, Derek? It will, Mrs Gates, Derek agrees. We need lots of practice, don't we, Derek? We do, Derek nods. Then Dad comes into the kitchen to make some tea, followed by Delia, who ignores me and everyone else. Mum's still wafting my shoes around with him. You can't go to school in these, Tom. They're falling to pieces. Aren't we all, Dad laughs. Speak for yourself. Mum gives Dad a stare and raises her eyebrow. And she looks at me and says, I'll just have to get you a strong, sensible pair of shoes myself. Luckily, Mum then gets distracted by Delia leaving her dirty plate and mug in the sink. Let's go and call Norman, I whisper to Derek. So we sneak out of the kitchen and the time he's awa- this time he's awake, he says he's on his way over. Derek seems pleased, but that's mostly because of the money he's just found in his pocket. Let's go to the shop and get something nice, he suggests, which is a great idea. I tell Mum and Dad we're going to the shop so fast that they don't have a chance to ask for milk or anything else like they normally do as we're heading towards the shop we bump right into norman when i say when i say bump what i really mean is he leaps out at us from behind the shelter and says boo and gives us a massive shock it takes us a while to calm down norman's holding a copy of dr planet book so i ask him is that book scary not really but i did get these free with it he turns his back to us and sticks around, wearing on these stick on eyes. Ha <laughs> ha! I'm not sure Norman looks that different, but I don't say that. Derek thinks he got enough money to buy fruit juice for all of us, which is nice of him. But in the shop, people keep staring at us, which is odd, until I see what Norman's doing now. It's a good look for you, Norman, I tell him. Thanks. The fruit juice have put us all in a very good mood for band practice. We, pop, we walk past the bus shelter again, and this time we make a big put. We notice a big poster for the band battle competition. Norman leapt out at us before. Look, Derek points. It's a sign we could win, Norman says through his T-shirt. Do you think everyone else who sees the poster will think that too, I wonder? Let the band battle begin. Thank you and good night. Enter the competition that the ro- and win the prize at the Rock Weekly Festival. We take turns in standing in front of the poster and pretending the crowd are cheering for us then Derek looks closely at the small writing on the poster and says please fill in the application and send it along with the track from your band by the end of this month at the latest no entries will be accepted from the date isn't it the end of the month in two days time Derek asks he's right not long then I say Norman's not really taking much notice he's looking at the ground someone is wearing the pointiest shoes I've ever seen they're so pointy, they're sticking out from under the bus shelter. Look, Norman whispers a bit loudly, watch this. Then, before we can stop him, the pointy shoes suddenly have a pair of stick-on eyes. We try not to laugh when the pointy shoes start moving. We can we turn around and run really fast in the other direction. We don't stop until we get to my house. I'd love to know who wears pointy shoes like that as they slightly out of breath. They'll be wondering where the eyes came from, Derek says to Norman. He's busy looking for another place to stick his eyes. 
I need to find my guitar for band practice, so we pop into my house first. Turn on the TV if you want. I won't be too long, I tell Derek and Norman, but when I come back, they're just sitting there looking at this note. Sorry, that's my mum. She's the TV police, I tell them to groan. How about some fresh air, Tom, or any homework to do before you watch TV? All that running away from pointy shoes has made us thirsty. Let's nip to the kitchen and get some water, I suggest and add. I'd offer you a snack if I could find them. I can see them, Norman says. Me too, Dirk shouts. Sure enough, there's a whole packet of wafers on top of the kitchen cupboard. I don't think Mum will mind if I give my friends a wafer each. Norman and Derek equals guests. He's always telling me treats are for guests. Well, that's what I'm going to say if she finds out. I take the wafers down and I'm about to hand them out when I have an idea. If we do the wafer biscuit trick, Mum might spot they've all gone for a while. So that's what we do. I take three wafers out and leave the empty wrappers. I carefully put them back where they came from. They're all done, which is just as well, because as we're finishing the last bits of wafer, Mum comes in and starts chatting. Hello, boys. Now, Tom, are you sure you don't want to come with me to buy your lovely new school shoes? No, Mum, I'm sure. She's being embarrassing. OK, it's a bit early, as you've got band practice. Would you like a caramel wafer? What, I say? No, first then, yes, so Mum doesn't get suspicious. I'll get them, I shout. Mum laughs. Trust you to know where they are, Tom. Whoops. Okay, well. Derek and Norman watch me bring the wafers down. I take them off the shelf really carefully so I don't squash the empty ones, all three of them. I hand out a wafer and each keep and keep one for myself. We all hold them really gently, which is not easy to do, especially for Norman. Mum says, I'll have one too if there's a spare. Luckily, there's one real wafer left. Phew. Mum starts eating hers and wonders why we're not eating ours. That's not like you, Tom. Aren't they your favourite? We're saving them, I explain, for band practice at Derek's. We're leaving now, I add, so we can go. I grab my guitar and keep holding on to my wafer right up until we get to Derek's garage. That was lucky, Derek says. Norman, Norman's wrapper got squashed while he was squeezing past the cat barrier, so we haven't even started listening to Derek's song or practising when Mr Fingal appears and says, If you see that cat, will you shoo it away? Yes, Dad, Derek says. Is this dog zombie's band practice? Sort of, I tell him. We're entering the band battle competition. Here we go, Derek whispers. What song are you playing then? We're learning a new song, or trying to, Derek tells him. Derek's written a song about a cat. It's really good, I say. It's not finished yet, Derek adds. And the audition is in two days, so we need to set off recording, off, off, off a recording of it. Norman seems surprised. Two days? Mr. Fingal is shaking his, his head. Playing a new song could be risky. I'd stick to one you all know. I can help you record it if you want. It kind of makes sense. We'll do my cat song another time, Dirt says. Wild thing, Norma shouts, which is a good idea. Always classic, Mr. Ful- Mr. Fingal tells us. So, wild thing it is. We're about to have a practice when Mr. Fingal starts shushing again. He creeps over to the door. Look, it's that cat again. I can't see anything yet, but the door starts open very slowly. And Mr. Fingal gets ready to shoo it away. We're trying to have band practice here, Dad, Derek says. His dad whispers, I think it's my dad. What's he doing here? Mr. Fingal stops shushing cats in time to say, They're, They were just about to play Wild Thing. My dad says he's come round to help us. Well, that's what he says. But every time we try to practice, Mr. Fingal and Dad start chatting about what song they play, if it was them auditioning for band battle. Uh, hello, our band practice, Derek tells them. We need to record the song and send it off, he adds. Then Dad reminds us that we have a recording already. Remember? I don't. I can send it off for you if you'd like, he tells us. OK, Dad. Which seems like a good idea, especially as Mr. Fingal has moved on talking about June's cat. He's almost ruined the whole box of records, fur everywhere. That cat's been our, in our garden too, Dad starts telling him. Norman is doing random drawing now, which means no one hears the door start to open again. And this time, it really is. June's dad. What's he doing here? Sorry to bother you, but June says our cat might have sneaked into your house. He's been wandering around a lot, I'm afraid. Straight away, Mr. Finger rushes off to check his records. There's no sign of a cat, which is a relief for you. Thanks for checking, June's dad says. Then he looks around and asks, Are you boys in a band then? Yes, we're called dog zombies, I tell him. I used to be in a band too, June's dad says. My dad and Mr. Finger both says, What band were you in then? We're listening to. I doubt you'd have heard of us. We were around in the 90s playing rock. I'm a huge 90s rock fan, Mr. Fingal says. 
What is their band called? Dad asks. Plastic Cup. Which makes both of our dads go, Really? I've got all your albums. I've never heard of Plastic Cup. Dad's going to start playing them. We have to listen to the whole album if we stay here. Dad warns us. My dad and Mr. Fingal are a bit overexcited to be meeting a member of Plastic Cup, even if it's just June's dad, which is weird. We might as well go to our, um, go to your place now, Tom, Dirk says, which is a good idea, because we can watch the Crazy Fruit Bunch. Mum won't tell me to turn off the TV if I have friends with me. We leave the dads all talking about the album cover, which, as far as I can see, is just a plastic cup. Dad promises to send off our track for the band battle audition when he gets home. I can't believe he was in plastic cup, he whispers to me. OK, Dad, calm down, I tell him. Me, Norman and Derek leave them all to it, and we accidentally leave the garage door open as well. The first thing I have to do is take down Mum's note that's stuck to the TV. Then I turn on the crazy fruit bunch. Norman jumps up to help himself to the fruit bowl on the table. We're a bit like, crazy fruit bunch, aren't we? He says, putting the fruit on his head. Derek joins in, and I do as well, when the doorbell rings. I go to answer it, still balancing the fruit. It's June. I would have taken the fruit off my head if I'd known it was her. It's my dad, she asks me. Uh, no, he's next door at Derek's. We're watching the crazy fruit bunch, I tell her, trying to explain the fruit. Haven't you seen it? No, Tom, thanks. I'll ne- I'll go next door then. He peers into the house and catches slight of Derek- sight of Derek and Norman. It's a really funny cartoon, I tell her. I'll take your word for it. I forget she doesn't have a TV. June's about to leave when Mum comes down to see who it is. Hello, June. Have you come round to play? Mum just said play, groan. I'm just looking for my dad, thanks, June tells her. Well, you're very welcome to come round any time, isn't she, Tom? I nod and a banana falls off my head. I manage to close the door and wave goodbye to June just in time before Mum whips out a bag and says, I was so lucky to get these for you and shows me a massive chunky pair of shoes. Mum says, I hope they don't. I hope they fit, Mum says. I hope they don't. You can watch more cartoons if you try them on, Tom. Mm. Okay, then. Here goes. But I look like a clown. Mum says I'll last for ages. I'm not wearing them to school. No way. Before I can take them off, Delia sees me and she can't stop laughing. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha. They're not that funny, Delia, Mum says. Derek and Norman have come out to see what's going on. I can tell from their faces that they think of my shoes. Ha, 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 ha. I can't wear them, Mum. Besides, they're too tight. They're actually quite comfy, but I don't tell her that. Really? That's a shame. They're such good sturdy school shoes, Tom. Delia laughs even more. Sturdy and massive. Right, that's it. I'm taking them off, Mum says. She'll try and take the shoes back to the shop if she can. Or you'll have to wear them. They'd make a good doorstop, Delia laughs. My shoe humiliation is almost worth it, as we get to watch a lot of the Crazy Fruit Bunch. Good news. Dad sent off our Wild Thing song to the band battle competition and Dog Zombies have got an audition already. It's tomorrow after school, Tom, Dad tells me at breakfast. That was quick, I say. They know a good band when they hear it, he says, smiling at me. There's not much time to get nervous, even though I will. That's what I tell Derek on our way to school. He says, great, not wearing your shoes then. Never, I say, shaking my head. Did They, they didn't make me laugh though. Exactly, that's why I'm never wearing them. Derek tells me that he has a spare pair that I can borrow if I ever need a backup plan. Good thinking, Derek. That's why he's my best mate. And he tells me he'll watch the alien film his class made this week too. It's quite funny. But the really good news is the inspectors have gone. At last! Hooray! It's easy to tell they've left because Mr. Fullerman isn't wearing the bow tie. And more. And the teachers are more relaxed. Sigh. Mr. Fullerman wants to know if everyone has... Their signed reading diaries today. Marcus says, yes, really loudly, and Amy has hers too. I have mine, but I need to add another signature to it. I'll do it at break time when no one's looking. After enrichment week, going back to maths means I have to concentrate, which is tricky when I keep thinking about the audition tomorrow and a few other things too. I still have my string, so I fiddle with that while answering the questions on my maths worksheet. I wish I had one box of chocolates right now. Mm. Math worksheet. John has bought 25 boxes of chocolates and there are 36 chocolates in each box. How many chocolates did John buy? A lot. It's a struggle, but I managed to get the worksheet done. 
and add a sneaky signature to my reading diary too. Not bad for a morning's work. I'm thinking about doing another string deeder when Mr. Fullerman tells me to put that string away, Tom. Yes, sir. That was close. Now, everyone, pay attention, Mr. Fullerman says to the class. I'm hoping it's not another maths worksheet. Shall I read the next part of the story? Yes, I do an air punch. Air punch. Chapter 2. Mayor Cuthbert Bottle checked himself in the mirror. Well, look at me, he said, smoothing down an eyebrow with his manicured finger. Don't I look absolutely gorgeous? The mayor patted his strange puffy hair, which moved ever so slightly to the right and then to the left. He stared at the two food inspectors, who were standing behind him in their white coats. Don't you both agree? he asked them. Walter and Roger gulped. Was this a trick question? The wrong answer would put the mayor in a bad mood all day, and they didn't want that to happen. Walter took a deep breath and said, Yes, mayor, you look very handsome indeed, he said. I agree, Roger, added. What a great sea you have on, and your hair. Oh, your hair, Roger. Roger paused as he searched for the right words to use. Well, as never looked so unbelievably fluffy, he said excitedly. The mayor seemed pleased with both the answers, which was a relief. Tell me, are, th are there any press photographers lurking outside in my bushes waiting to take a sneaky picture of me, he wondered. Absolutely not, Mayor Bottle. We made sure no one from the press, press would be snooping until everything has gone exactly to plan. And has everything gone to plan, the mayor asked while trying to look them both in the eye, which wasn't easy to do, since he was a very short man. Yes, mayor, it's all gone exactly to plan. Both the food inspectors crossed their fingers behind their backs and smiled nervously. Well, may I suggest then, the mayor said calmly, that you get those photographers back here right now, he shouted. Not so calmly. I love a plan. I want to see pictures of me looking fantastic. I want headlines in all the papers that say, Bug-infested tea shop closed down at last, replaced by luxury skys skyscraper bottle towers. The mayor was yelling and waving his arms around so dramatically that the small squirrel asleep on top of his head almost woke up. Nobody ever mentioned the mayor's very odd ha hairstyle, not his, his face anyway. For some reason, the mayor thought his hair looked more natural with the odd comb over, but as you can see, it really didn't. Yes, mayor, Walter, Walter and Roger said while moving swiftly into action we'll do that right away let me know when the photographers arrive so i can pretend to be surprised the mayor said while checking himself in the mirror again you might have gathered already unless you haven't been paying attention the mayor cuthbert bottle wasn't a very nice person the mayor came from a really long line of rotten relatives so it was hardly surprising that he turned out to be so mean his own parents were not exactly a lovable couple Mr. and Mrs. Bottle made no secret of the fact from the moment their baby son was born, they had both felt deeply and utterly disappointed. He's not much of a looker, is he? Mrs. Bottle said while staring at her son. He takes after you then, Mr. Bottle laughed back. What should we call him apart from facially ch challenged? Mr. Bottle wondered. With that face, we'd better call him something ridiculous. He learns to stick up for himself fast, Mr. Bottle said. So they gave... Their son, the silliest name they could think of, Cuthbert Banjo Baby Bottle. And it didn't take long for the Cuthbert Bottle to learn the rotten ways of his parents. He went from being a slightly pleasant baby to hideous teenager. He grew up to be vain and a vile man. You get the picture. You're fired. And as Cuthbert got older, he became quite successful in business by lying, bribing and cheating his way right to the top of the ladder. Cuthbert loved the thrill of power, and after a few dodgy deals with a little bit of rope fixing, okay, a lot of rope fixing, Cuthbert eventually managed to become the mayor of the whole city. But having a fancy title and wearing a fabulous chain of office wasn't enough for Cuthbert. He was a very greedy man and wanted more, much more. I was after already a flashy magazine about rich and powerful people that he announced. It was a huge skyscraper tower full of... I want a huge skyscraper tower full of luxury shops and apartments with my very own name emblazed in every door. The Bottle, not the Cuthbert name, in case you were wondering. Mayor Bottle dreamt of living right at the top of this tower, where he could look down on everyone else in the city. Remember, he was a very short man, so looking down on people other than children wasn't something he did very often. I want to build bottle towers right here, the mayor said, thinking everything was going to be all easy peasy. Then he gave the order 
Then he gave the order to buy every building that was in his way. But not everyone wanted to sell, so he pretended the buildings were falling down, which almost worked. There was only one building that didn't want to move or sell, and that was the tea shop. Mr and Mrs Crumble didn't believe their shop was falling down. Besides, it was their home, and where would they go? Mayor Bottle was furious with the Crumbles. He wanted them out, so he hatched a plan and rubbed his hands together at the thought of what was about to happen. If his plan worked, this would be the last day of the tea shop would be ever open. I'm fed up of that sickly sweet family and their hideous children, Apple and Plum. They're going to be toast today, he laughed at himself. In other words, Mayor Bottle had found a way of nicking, kicking them out of the tea shop for good. Ha ha ha. The mayor double-checked with the food inspectors again. Do you have the condemned notice and compulsory purchase order? Yes, Mayor Bottle, we do. Roger waved some bits of official-looking paper around. I want to see those crumbles. Crumble! The mayor laughed at his own joke, and the inspectors laughed with him to keep him happy. Then what are we waiting for? I'm ready, I'm ready for my close-up. Mayor Bottle took one more look in the mirror, then stepped outside. He was good at pretending to be surprised by photographers. Chapter 3 In the tea shop, Mr and Mrs Crumble and their children, Apple and Plum, were arranging the very last plate of cakes on the beautiful stand. Somehow they had managed the impossible task of cleaning up the tea shop and making a whole new batch of cakes and biscuits before the mayor and his inspectors were due to arrive. Everyone was exhausted, but the whole place looked sparkling and almost like nothing had ever happened. There hadn't been enough time to make every kind of bread and cake again, but there were plenty of chocolate brownies. Mr. Crumble looked around. Are we ready? He asked. As ready as we'll ever be, Mrs. Crumble said nervously. Stop, shouted Apple. She ran across the tea room, and without hesitating, she stamped her foot down on the ground. There was a crunching sound, and then Apple moved her shoe. Got it, she said, looking over at the squash bug. Get a napkin quickly and wipe it up. Be careful not to leave anything on the floor. No legs, arms or bits of the body, okay? Mrs. Crumble told her. Apple cleaned up the bug in just in time because outside they could hear the vans and cars that belonged to Mayor Cuthbert Bottle and his team of food inspectors arriving. If this doesn't work, we could lose the shop, Mr. Crumble said. It will work, Mr. Crumble assured him as as she turned the closed sign of the tea shop door to say open and they all waited for the mayor to come inside. Mr. Fullerman slams the book shut. Sir, what happens in the rest of the story? Brad Galloway asks. This book's in the library if you want to read the ending, or I can read the rest to you another time. We all say, yeah. He's in a good mood, I say to Amy. All the teachers are now the inspectors have gone. True. We all go to out to break, and I look round to see if I can spot Norman, so I can remind him about tomorrow's audition, even though I called him. He might have forgotten. There it comes with me. I think I can see him over there, he says. It looks like Norman. He's big. He's busy swinging around on a climbing frame with both arms right up until he sees us and waves and lets go, which is a mistake. Norman's on the ground but says he's fine. My finger is a bit grazed and my knee's been bashed and my foot, but apart from that, I'm okay. We've got our band battle audition tomorrow. Are you all right? Derek asks him. Of course. Don't panic. We'll be great. Then Norman gets up and swings around a bit more. I remind him again, just in case. We'll meet up and go to my house after school tomorrow. Okay, Norman, he says. What for? Like he's forgotten. Then, only joking. Very funny, Norman. Audition meter. Good. It's today. I'm having a nice dream about a giant caramel wafer. Then it starts to feel like someone is shaking me. When I open my eyes, I see Delia. Tom, Tom, what have you done to my clothes? They're all covered in fur and it's making my eyes water. Huh? Delia does look like she's been rolled in fur. That's suspiciously the same colour as June's cat's. Did you let the cat into my room? No, I tell her. But I'm not totally sure. She stomps out, so I get up and get dressed quickly in case she decides to stomp back in again. Then I nip downstairs only to find another tricky situation. There's a note. There's a note on the new school shoes Mum bought for me. She really wants me to wear them. Dad's, o- Dad's already up and says, they're not that bad, Tom. Better than your old shoes. I don't think so, Tom. Please wear them to school. I can't take them back, Mum. Smiley face. Besides, you don't have another decent pair, do you? That's where he's wrong. I have a pair of backup shoes at Derek's, I tell Dad. Oh, OK, he says. I'll wear them today. They're proper school shoes. Well, as long as they fit you and Derek doesn't mind. 
We're the same size, I told Dad confidently, but it turns out Derek's backup shoes are a tiny bit snug. I just say thanks, Derek, and keep that to myself. They do look better than my old pair. At least I've remembered to bring my swimming kit for PE today and some shampoo. Normally, I wouldn't bother with washing my hair, but as we've got the audition after school, I thought I'd try to scrub, and Amy told me I still had a white powdery stuff on my head the other day, which I'm guessing was a bit of flour. A bit embarrassing. As I'm walking to school, I discover that Derek's backup shoes are a bit more, are a bit more than snug. They're rubbing the back of my heels, so I walk slowly, which helps. All set for the audition tonight, Derek asks. I'm looking forward to it, I tell him. I sort of am. It'll be fine, I hope. In class, Mr. Fullerman does a super fast registration and gets us onto the coach to go swimming in no time at all. Get changed as quickly as you can, please, he tells everyone. Why, all, why are school swimming lessons or are always such a rush, though taking off my backup shoes is a massive relief. I have my swimming trunks, which is good, but I've forgotten my swimming goggles, which is bad. I ask, has anyone got a spare pair of goggles? Marcus is wearing his goggles, and he says, I do, but I'm not allowed to lend them to anyone. Thanks for telling me, Marcus. Luckily, Solid has a spare. They're a bit big, and I need to adjust, adjust them, which is tricky. I squeeze them on, and it feels like my eyes are popping out of my head now. Moving them around helps a little bit during the lesson. They keep filling with water and steaming up. I spend most of the lesson trying to sort them out. I just get I just get them comfortable. When the lesson's over, I give Solid them back, back his goggles and he tells me I've been wearing them upside down. You've got goggle marks around your eyes now. Oh, he adds. They'll go, I say confidently. Well, I hope so. In the shower, I squeeze a big blob of shampoo into my hand. I think that's sun cream... Tom, Sally tells me. What, Bray? I must have picked up the wrong bottle, so I can't wash my own hair now. I wipe the rest of the cream to my towel. Then I get dressed and try getting rid of my goggle marks by rubbing my face with my towel. You look like a panda, Tom, Marcus tells me on the coach back to school. The goggle marks are still there then. Actually, you look like a red panda. Your face is all red too. They're goggle marks and they'll fade, I explain, rubbing them with a, a towel didn't. Rubbing them with a towel didn't work then. Haven't you got a band battle audition later, he reminds me smugly. Yes, dog zombies got three. You might still look like a panda if those marks don't go. They're just goggle marks. They'll go. I'm going to ignore him now. When we get back to school, other kids start staring at me too. Even Mr. Fullerman asks if I'm feeling okay. They're just swimming goggle marks, sir, I tell him as I sit, as I sit down. Then Amy says, I look a bit blotchy. Blotchy. Yes, your face looks funny colour and your hands do too. I have a closer look and there are slightly orangey brown colour. That's odd. I'll go and wash it off. It's nothing, I say. Only it doesn't wash off and by the end of the school day, my patchy looking face has got a tiny bit worse. Because of the audition tonight, Norman and Derek meet at the school gate so we can walk back together. They look a bit surprised. Don't worry, it'll wash off, I tell them. We get past the audition poster again, which reminds me about Norman's sticky on eyes and those pointy shoes too. I tell them both, what kind of person wears pointy shoes like that, Derek asks, an alien Norman laughs. Speaking of shoes, Derek's are still pinching my feet, but I'm not going to worry about that now, because we've only just got enough time to grab something to eat, then get changed. Norman's wearing his t-shirt under his uniform. Saves time, he says. Great, I can tell Dad that the dog zombies are ready to go. Mum comes back from work with Delia behind her. She stops and looks at me. Have you been... Using my fake tan, Tom. Fake tan? No, of course not. You do look a bit orange, Tom, Derek says. The goggle marks are fading, though. Then Delia butts in and says, Just call your band the Oompa Loompas. You'll be fine. I'm not orange, I tell Delia. You are a bit, Tom, Mum says. She looks in my swimming bag and brings out what I thought was shampoo. This is my fake tan. You must have got it on your face. There's not enough time to wash it off properly, and Dad says we'll be late if we don't go now. But Mum shouts, Wait, come here, Tom. And she... And she only goes and wipes my face with some kind of cloth. It's so embarrassing. But most of the fake tan's gone now. I just look a bit streaky. As we're leaving, Delia says, Even slightly orange, you're still better than those nerdy boys in jumpers. Which for Delia is almost a compliment. Dad drives us to the audition, but he's forgotten to bring all the right paperwork with him. Which means we stand in the wrong queue for a while before anyone notices. Wrong way. And we almost miss our audition time. I spot the year sixes from our school who are already on stage. They're good, Derek says. I know, I agree. 
Dad gives us a little talk before it's our turn. It's not the end of the world if you don't get through. Just do your best. The standard is pretty high. So don't be disappointed. You'll be fine. It's like he doesn't think we've got a chance. A lady tells us we're on next. There are drums and keyboards already set up, but we have to wait for the other band to pick up their guitars before we can go on. While while we're waiting, I catch sight of some very familiar-looking pointy shoes. Psst. I try and get Derek and Norman's attention. Look over there. Derek is sw- squinting and trying to see pointy shoes. I'm making pointy shoes signs with my hands when whoever is behind the curtain suddenly steps out and waves at us. It's only the school inspector in pointy shoes. He says, good luck. I saw your name on the audition list. Just thought I'd say hello before I have to go back to judging. I used to be a music teacher and a musician before I was an inspector, in case you're wondering. He's a judge who wears really pointy shoes. We've got no chance of getting through the audition now. With him as a judge, I whisper. Come on, dog zombies, Norman shouts. I suddenly remember that I bought a pair of shades with me that will hide en- a shades with me that will hide any goggle marks or fake tan streaks still lurking on my face. So I pop them on and walk to the microphone. Well, I hobble because Derek's because of Derek's snug shoes. Hello, we're dog zombies and we're playing Wild Thing. Here it goes. We do an okay job for playing this song right up until I have to take off my shades. So I can't see what's what I'm playing properly, which is a tiny bit awkward. Well done, dog zombies. Thanks for coming and we'll be in touch. The inspector, sorry, the judge says. And that's it. We're all done. The audition's over. We go to find Dad who's outside and guess who's waiting to play next. Only the nerdy boys who are wearing brand new novelty jumpers for the occasion. As we walk past, Norman says, nice jumpers. Dad's waiting and wants to know how we did. Well, apart from my shades being so dark I couldn't see what I was playing. It was okay, sort of, I say. We tell Dad about the school inspector being a good judge. It's true. I don't mention, one, me bumping into the inspector all the time, two, me getting caught dueling a picture of him. Dad doesn't need to know about that. I do mention his his pointy shoes. Imagine if he'd seen you stick the eyes on Norman, Derek laughs. It was a lucky escape there. Once we're in the car, Dad says, I'm, I've nearly forgot. Your mum suggested that after the audition, I could take you to the shops to buy a nice, I think he's going to say, pair of sensible shoes. So I say, I don't want to go. I look extra fed up to make a point. Dad says, well, okay, if you really don't want to go to get an ice cream, that's fine with me. Of course we want ice cream. Your dad's funny, Norman says. Hilarious, I know, I say, trying to decide what flavour to have. Chocolate and caramel, of course. Chances of winning bun battle meter, no chance. The bad news is dog zombies didn't make it through to the ban battle audi- auditions. We're not going to play the rock at the Rock Weekly Festival. I'm not that disappointed. The more you practice, the better you get, Dad tells me, which sounds like something Uncle Kevin would say. But the good news is, Mum found a much better use for the massive shoes in the end. She filled them with pebbles and wedged them against Delia's door to stop June's cat from sneaking into her room again. Rooster's been keeping him away from Derek's house too. At school, Amy tells me that the year six kids didn't get through to the auditions either, and they were her slows more than we did. Marcus is still annoying though. I heard your audition was a disaster, he tells me. It wasn't that bad, but we didn't get through. I really wanted to go to the Rock Weekly Festival, Marcus says. Me too, I say. It's the first time we've agreed about something for ages. Mr. Fullerman says that our parents will be getting a copy of the school inspection report soon. Overall, the school did very well. There were a few issues with lateness. I look straight straight ahead like I don't know what he means. But because you all did so well, Mr. Fullerman says... We can have a screening of a film Mrs. Worthington's class did in the hall today. Hooray! We all cheer. And I'll read you the final chapters of the very special recipe. We all cheer again. Hooray! After our double mash lesson. Silence. Then Mrs. Mumble comes in and asks if she could borrow someone to help her put chairs out in the hall. My hand goes up fast so I get picked straight away. Avoid maths equals result. I help Mrs. Mumbles with the chairs while feeling quite pleased with myself that I've got out of doing maths. I take my time going back to the class by dawdling as much as possible. And when I walk in, Mr. Fullerman is just finishing the story. What? Have I missed the ending, sir? I thought we were doing maths. Yes, sorry, Tom. It was my little joke. 
We did maths the other day. You can take the book out of the library if you want and add it to your reading diary, which I hope you're keeping up to date. Yes, sir. Sort of. Marco says, I can tell you the ending. No, I want to read it. Don't say anything. I have to stick my fingers in my ears so I can't hear him. La, la, la. Not listening. Not listening. He stopped. If I fill in the last few pages of my reading diary myself, I'll be able to get a brand new one. Then mum and dad can start signing it again. Mr. Fullerman lets me go to the library at lunch so I can take out the book and read the ending. But when I get there and try to find it, Miss Page, the librarian, says, Someone's just taken it out. Already? Yes, it's the boy there. He said he wanted to read it again. He might let you read it first if you ask him, he tells me. But when I see who it is, why bother? He'll only say no, or tell me the ending, or both. I'll just have to wait until he's read the whole book again, groan. I'm about to go to lunch when Miss Page runs over and says, Is your lucky day, Tom? She's only found another copy of the book. Yes, I'll get to read the ending after all, despite Marco's lucky meter, very lucky. I'm here now. I take a quick look at the last page of the book. I can't help myself. Then I pop it into my bag to read later at home. But the highlight of the whole day has to be watching the film that Derek's class made. We watch it in the hall, and I don't think I've ever heard the school laugh that loudly before. Solid was laughing so much, he nearly squashed me. This is what made us laugh the most. Mrs. Worthington's extreme alien close-up. So funny. And I still have my book to read. But avoiding Marcus is getting tricky. He keeps rushing up to me and trying to tell me the ending. The bit with the bugs is really good. It all finishes with, Hey Marcus, I say to him. Remember this, Ooh, bugs, which shuts him up for a while. I ignore him as much as I can until the bell goes. When I get home, I manage to watch a bit of the crazy fruit bunch first. Then I fill my reading diary and sign it. Then I really impress Mum by casually mentioning that I'm going to go to bed early so I can read my book. Now, where was I? Mayor Bottle arrives at the tea shop. Good afternoon, Mayor. I'm so glad you could join us, Mrs Crumble said. She tried to shake the Mayor's hand, but he ignored her and walked into the shop. A food inspector took Mrs Crumble's hand, but didn't shake it. Instead, he dabbed it with a cotton bud and placed the bud in a sealed pot for testing. Start as we mean to go on, the Mayor said coldly. Mrs. Crumble looked surprised. It's a shame we have to do this inspection on your tea shop, but someone reported there were bugs and cockroaches around this area, and we can't be too careful, can we? I'm sure you don't want to find anything like that. I'm sure you won't find anything like that here, Mr. Crumble told him. This could all be avoided if you change your mind about the moving, the mayor added. This tea shop is not going anywhere, and neither are we, Mrs. Crumble told him. We'll see about that, the mayor said, taking a seat on one of the tables. Shall we get started, he said. When he waved his hand at the inspectors, who began to pull out their rubber gloves. Walter's inspection team started in the tea room. They dabbed, swabbed and scraped everywhere they could reach. Roger's team went to the kitchen. They looked through the fridges, posts, pans, dishes and right into the oven that was still warm from baking brownies. The Crumble family watched them closely and tried to stay calm. Mr. Crumble approached the mayor and very politely asked him, As this is going to take a while, mayor, I, could I possibly tempt you to try a hot chocolate with maybe a lovely warm sticky brownie? He lifted up a plate of the brownies and wafted them under the mayor's nose so he could smell how fresh they were. And the mayor's hair began to move slowly on its own. I'm not expecting to be here very long, the mayor said, looking at the brownies. They did smell good and he was quite hungry. They'll be close soon enough, so why not? Yes, pass them here, he muttered as he helped himself to a brownie. It was rich and sticky, cut into a square and dusted with icing sugar. Then Mrs. Crumble went to make the mayor a hot chocolate. He stood some of his special ready-grated chocolate into the warm milk, then poured it onto a bowl to throth, to throth up. Mr. Crumble ladled the stick delicious cho chocolatey mixture into a mug. He took that everything was perfect and stirred it up with some, a lot more than usual, just in case. Would you like one marshmallow or two with your hot chocolate, Mr. Crumble asked. Try three, the mayor told him greedily, and another brownie too. The mayor sat on the table and enjoyed being waited on. With one slurp, all three marshmallows disappeared. He bit into the brownie. Mm, that's not bad. Do you have a special recipe for these, he wanted to know. Mr. Crumble coughed. Er, uh, yes, mayor, we do. We have a special ingredient that we like to keep a secret. <coughs> when the tea shop is closed, you must give me the recipe, he laughed with his mouth full. The Crumble family watched him eat and said nothing. Chapter 4 The inspectors continued to work while the mayor ate his treats. 
So far they'd found nothing, not one single little sign that any bugs had ever been here. Walter and Roger were beginning to wonder how this could have happened. It was the right shot we went into last night, wasn't it? Walter whispered to Roger. Yes, of course it was. I pulled the bugs down the pipe myself. I should know. If this doesn't work, we'll have to go to Plan B, Walter whispered again. What's Plan B? Roger wondered. You did bring a Plan B with you, didn't you? Walter could tell from Roger's face that he'd forgotten to bring a Plan B. Plan B stood for Plan Bug, which was to bring spare bugs and drop them around when no one was looking. We could try Plan C, Roger whispered. What's Plan C? Walter wanted to know. We cry and hope the mayor feels sorry for us. Walter muttered, idiot, under his breath, and carried on searching for something that resembled a tiny mouse dropping or two. The mayor had helped himself to yet another brownie and finished off the last of his hot chocolate. He was getting impatient and wanted to know what was going on. This tea and cake stuff is all very nice, but I... But what I really want to know is, have you found anything yet? No one said a word, until the inspector held up a sock. I found this under the counter. I've been looking for that, Plum told him, and took it back. Never mind that. Where are the co- cockroaches? The mayor bellowed. Well, so far, mayor, there's no sign of any bugs and pests, Roger said. But we're still looking, Walter told the mayor. The mayor's face turned purple with rage, and he had a bit too much sugar. He looked like he was about to explode. There must be something here. You promised me there would be. That was the plan, he shouted at Walter. The inspectors lined up and shook their heads as neither of them had found a single trace of a bug, mouse, rat or cockroach in the tea shop. Mr. Crumble interrupted. Does that mean we've passed the inspection then, Mr. Mayor? The the mayor stood up and pushed away the table. Listen, Crumble, don't you think you've gotten away with this? I'll find a way to build my tower right here. He stomped his foot and the squirrel on his head opened its eyes. It was hard for Apple and Plum not to stare at his head. Mr. Crumble tried to calm everyone down by saying, It would be such a shame to let all these good cakes go to waste. If you're leaving, let me give give you them to take home with you. The inspectors all nodded in agreement, then looked at the mayor. Mr. Crumble handed the mayor a large box of brownies that were tied up with a ribbon. No hard feelings, mayor. Take the box home with you and eat them later. The mayor snatched the brownies. He did like them after all, then spun round angrily and said, I don't know what you've done or how you've done it, but somewhere in this tea shop there must be one tiny bug or even a rodent of some kind. And when I find it, your tea shop will be closed for good. The mayor's hair began to move as he shouted. Apple and Plum started to laugh. Listen, kiddies, you might be laughing now, but when this place is gone and you have nowhere to live, then you'll be sorry, the vile mayor told them. The inspectors were trying not to laugh too. The squirrel's tail had slipped down over the mare's flate, over the mare's face. Plum pointed to the mare's head and said, "Mister Mayor, is that squirrel on top of your head? Is that a squirrel on top of your head?" Everyone went silent. Silent. Look, there it's peeking out. Plum laughed again. The mare was furious. How dare they mention my hair? He flew into rage and stormed out of the tea shop and right into the press, where all the photographers took hundreds of pictures of him startled with a squirrel with a squirrel on top of his head. The inspectors left the shop happily taking all the cakes and brownies they could eat with them. We can't keep them. Have as many as you want, Mr Crumble handed Walter and Roger a box each too, which they gratefully took away. You must have got the wrong building. It's the only answer, Walter Walter said as he left the tea shop. They both knew they would be in trouble with the mayor. They'd worry about that later. The whole Crumble family breathed in a big sigh of relief and cheered. They shut the tea shop door and turned the sign to close. We did it. The tea shop was safe and still open for business and will remain open for quite some time to come. Chapter 5 But that's not quite the end of the story. If you've been paying close attention, you probably already guessed what happened to the bugs and vermin that invaded the tea shop. If you haven't, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you anyway. The first thing Mr Crumble did was trap all the mice and the rats in boxes, using cakes as bait. Then he sealed them up and posted them back to the food inspector's office. I love a surprise. And as for the bugs, let's just say that the secret recipe Mr. Crum- Mrs Crumble was talking about for the brownies, you won't find it in any cookbook ever. But just for you, here it is. Special brownie recipe. 185 grams unsalted butter. 185 grams... Best dark chocolate, 85 grams plain flour, 40 grams cocoa powder, 50 grams white chocolate, 3 grams 
large eggs, 275 grams golden caster sugar. Mix all the ingredients together, then add as many bugs as you can find and stir, in, stir them in thoroughly. Keep stirring until the mix is smooth and the bugs are mixed in completely. You might need a whisk to help you. And if you're wondering what happened to Mayor Cuthbert Banjo Baby Bottle, you can read all about it in the papers, because after the pictures of him appeared with a squirrel nestling on his head, a close a close friend let slip how the mayor had tried to force the tea shop out of business. He could buy the land for his tower. No one likes a bully, and at the next election he was voted out of the office. Thank- thankfully, the tea shop is still there and thriving and making delicious cakes and bread, but without any extra ingredients. The tower was never built, and Mayor Bottle, who is currently waiting for a hair transplant, lives with his pet squirrel at the top of a block of flats, which it which is as near as he's ever going to get to Bottle Towers. There were loads of other things that happened too, but we'll have to save them for another story. The end, for now.